This video is brought to you by my supporters on Patreon, Buy Me Coffee, and YouTube. If you'd like to support me, you can find the links below. This may perhaps be the biggest and most controversial video on my channel because I'm criticizing the government of India. There's a problem in my country that I feel is barely being addressed. And it's a problem that greatly affects its people. The government of India, instead of solving it or even ignoring it, is actually making the problem worse. I'm talking about alternative medicine. And if you're thinking alternative medicine may be ineffective, but it's harmless, so why is he making a big deal after this? This video is especially for you. Hi, my name is Pranav and you're watching Science. Do. In this video, I'm going to go into why alternative medicine is harmful and how the Indian government is contributing to that problem. And just so you don't have to take the word of some medically untrained guy, I decided to take a look at the actual research being done. Not only that, I talked to multiple doctors to see what they had to say on the topic. All that is coming up in the video and needless to say, I have to give a long video alert here. This video is the longest I've done, but I put timestamps below to make it easier for you. You might have to watch this video in multiple sessions. But that being said, let's begin. To start off with, I decided to go to Rajagiri Hospital, Kochi, where Dr. Abby Phillips works. Dr. Abby is a liver specialist and clinical researcher. I met him and his clinical research lead, Arif Hussain, to see the work they've been doing analyzing alternative medicines. Both of them are active on social media also. Dr. Abby does a chemical and toxicology analysis on these alternative medicines and posts the results on his Twitter, which I've linked below. Arif is another interesting personality. He's both an ex-Muslim and an ex-homeopath and I've featured him on the channel before and will do so again. I've linked his channel also below. His content is in Malayalam so if that's your cup of tea, be sure to check it out. Back to what I did there. Not only did I get to see the analysis they've done, they also showed me all the alternative medicines they confiscate from patients who come complaining of liver issues. I even got to sit down with Dr. Abby and do an entire podcast which will be released at a later date. But I've used parts of that podcast in this video as well. Imagine you're a doctor. What do you do if you get a patient complaining of a problem? You try to find out what the problem is and try to see if you can solve it using treatments or medicine. But what if you can't figure out what the problem is? That's what happened to Dr. Abby. I saw a group of patients with severe hepatitis, mm. jaundice and everything, uh, but without any identifiable cause. Mm. So there was no alcohol component there. They were all teetotalers. Mm. They had uh, probably some metabolic disease like diabetes or hypertension or hypothyroidism. But all that won't cause so much of jaundice. So then we looked at uh, viral infections. So mm. viral hepatitis A, E. So all of those infections, everything was actually negative. Mm. So then we looked at if they are taking some potentially liver toxic drugs. Mm. These people started thinking back and telling us, yeah, we started this particular supplement about a month back. Or, oh, I have been on this supplement for about three months. But this is not a drug. This is a natural supplement that, mm. you know, our other doctors have given. And we are continuing it with our whatever medicines that we are taking. Mm. So we asked them to bring those supplements to us. So we retrieved them. Mm. And we found out most of them were Ayurvedic formulations. Mm. And uh, most of them were traditional formulations. And some of them were proprietary formulations. Mm. Could these Ayurvedic supplements be the cause of the liver damage? Or... What if this was all just a coincidence? There's only one way to find out by actually figuring out what's in these alternative mints. And we subjected that to analysis, toxicology mm -hmm. and analysis and found out that a lot of them were contaminated. Some of them were adulterated mm -hmm. and some of them actually had well-known uh, liver toxic herbs in them. So it's, it's all of those causing uh, problems of liver damage in these patients. And mm -hmm. some of them even take liquid formulations. So these liquid formulations contain alcohol. Mm. So we have asavas and aristams mm. in, uh, in Ayurveda. 
and uh, that can actually cause alcoholic liver injury because they contain alcohol up to 10 to 12 percent alcohol mm -hmm. those medicines dr abby showed me an entire file of analysis results where they tested these alternative medicines and found toxic heavy metals etc in them they also found modern medicine competence like steroids in them dr abby posts these results on twitter regularly i'll post his handle on the screen and in the description you should definitely follow him now i'm sure there are people who go to ayurveda because they want to avoid steroids from modern medicine. And not only do they still get exactly that, they also don't get them in a safe manner with proper dosages and uh, supplementary medications to manage side effects. They also have a shelf full of these mostly Ayurvedic alternative medicines that they got from their patients. Now, this would be scary if this was a widespread problem. Maybe this is just an isolated incident, right? Maybe it happens only in one part of the country. I have this question. How much does it affect the public? How far and wide is this problem? How prevalent is this problem? The use of alternative medicine was at some point in the last year when we spoke to them was about uh, 60 percent. 60 percent of them used some form of alternative medicine within the last year that that they were on uh, other medications also. When we looked at in patients with underlying liver disease that went up to almost 70 to 75 percent. So a lot of people use complement alternative medicine on the side. Now, this is the usage of these uh, therapies. And what we found out that in our studies is that the people who actually use it, more than one third of them develop some sort of adverse event. This is clearly something that affects people all over the country because of the immense popularity of Ayurveda. We'll address what is being done about it and what should optimally be done about it. But why is Ayurveda and other alternative medicines so popular? I mean, given all these issues with alternative medicines, wouldn't people just stay away from it? Instead, it's really popular, which means there has to be something in it that works, right? When do you know something works? When it does what it claims to do. In fact, that's the basic criteria anything should meet. For example, if you have a plane, it should be able to fly. If it can't, then it's absolute garbage. In short, you cannot have alternative flight technology or alternative rocket science or alternative nuclear technology. There's a very clear line separating what works from what doesn't. But why do we still have an alternative medicine? Because with medicine, this judgment of whether the medicine works or not becomes difficult. There's no clear line separating the two. Let's say you had a cold and you took a pill and you got better. What made you get better? Was it the pill or was your cold just gonna get better on its own? It could have been any number of different factors that led to your recovery. One of these factors is the pill. But since people have a tendency to think that their recovery is entirely because of the pill, people forget or ignore that one of these other factors could have also led to your recovery. Someone in my family has a skin condition called psoriasis. They told me they cured it using Ayurveda. Most people will take the story and conclude positively about Ayurveda. But when you ask this person for more details on the story, you learn how their Ayurveda practitioner asked them to continue whatever modern medicine drugs they were taking that their doctor prescribed them. Also, let's please call it modern medicine and not allopathy because the two are very different. Allopathy was the heroic medicine that was there in Europe in the 17th and 18th century. It involved practices like drilling holes in skulls, induced vomiting, bloodletting, etc. that often harmed the patient more than it helped them. And clearly it wasn't very scientific either. So please stop calling modern medicine allopathy. Now back to our story. Psoriasis is a disease which comes and goes in phases. It flies up and then it dies down. So what they meant when they said that it got cured was that the flare-ups reduced in severity and occurred less frequently, sometimes with a gap of like 10 years, when that is the natural progression of the disease. That would happen whether or not you took any medicine. 
So you might ask yourself, what exactly did Ayurveda do here? I mean, sure, the person took Ayurvedic prescriptions and the condition got better, but it could have been due to any of these factors. It becomes hard to determine exactly what the contribution of Ayurveda is. It's even harder with something like homeopathy. Ayurveda at least has active molecules in its formulations. Homeopathy doesn't even have that. Because, and you can look this up, one of the principles of homeopathy is this. The greater the dilution, the greater the potency of the medicine. Homeopathic formulations are hence diluted so much that not a single active molecule remains in the solution. And what the patient ends up getting turns out to be just water. So why does homeopathy have such a sh**ty principle? Because back when they came up with it, basic chemistry wasn't well understood. Nobody knew that diluting a solution so much completely removed everything dissolved in it. In fact, all these schools of medicine, Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, they were all made at a time when we didn't know science very well. We didn't know how to evaluate what actually worked. And worst of all, these systems didn't update themselves as our knowledge advanced. Even today, they're mostly still the same with their disproven core principles unchanged. We'll talk about this failure to update themselves later on in the video, but right now I want to point out this irony. The irony that despite the fact that these medicines aren't made with basic scientific principles, or the fact that these medicines might not actually do anything in the body against the disease. Despite all this, all these schools of medicine have survived through the years simply because of the fact that sometimes recovery of a patient is not always because of the medicine. It may be due to something else. For centuries, we haven't been able to recognize this. It's time we do. At this point, some of you might ask me, hey, the same thing can be said of modern medicine drugs. Recovery of a patient can be due to other factors. So how do you know these medicines actually work? The question we must ask ourselves is, how can this drug or medicine or substance aid in recovery from disease by controlling all these other factors that influence results and by controlling any other biases or confounding factors that might lead to a misinterpretation of the results. Almost always in medicine and especially when testing a new drug, we use a large-scale double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial. This may look complicated, but it's actually pretty simple. Each of these words mean something and they're actually part of the study design that allows us to eliminate one or more of these confounding factors and tells us that the results of the study are solely because of this medicine and not something else. Whenever you see a study or a paper that reports on the effectiveness of a medicine, make sure the study is designed keeping these factors in mind. Often studies come out that are just poorly designed and you'll be able to spot them yourself if you understand what all this means. Let's start with an example. Let's say the whole world is hit with a new pandemic that causes everyone to get a fever and pretty soon someone comes up with a pill that they claim can reduce your fever but they've never tested it instead they're giving that job to you and they'll give you a smart supply of the pill as you need and as many test subjects as you need. So how do you figure out if it actually works? What if you give it to someone with a fever and see if their fever comes down? Wait, one person? That can't be enough. Even if the fever comes down, what if it was just a fluke? Why don't we try this with another person? In fact, let's try it on many more people. The more people we try it on, the more we guarantee that the pill works. There's still more to do, but this is a good place to start. You increase the scale of your trial to make it as large as possible. You made it a large scale trial, three more to go. You notice that even though you've made it large scale, all your test subjects are from the same age group. What if the people you chose were otherwise young and healthy and maybe that helped their bodies fight the disease more efficiently? You need to test your meds on some older people. But then again, why just limit your search based on age? Let's get people of all ages, genders, social backgrounds from different geographical locations, etc. All sorts of random people you've randomized your trial 
two terms down to Motoko. But if you just look at what you've done so far, you've eliminated a lot of the factors that would have otherwise influenced results. If a person in your trial is eating a diet that helps them, someone else might not be. If someone exercises a lot, someone else might not. If someone is young and healthy, someone else might not be. If one person has good genetics that help them fight a disease, someone else might not. You've basically averaged out all these factors across the whole group in such a way that their overall effect is zero. So large-scale randomization takes care of all these factors. But you're still not done. What if the fever is something that'll resolve on its own and the pill you gave had no effect? Or what if the pill has some kind of placebo effect? That is the mental relief that the patient feels that they're being taken care of and they're getting medicine is what heals them and not the medicine itself. There's no way to test that using this method. How about we divide them both into two groups and give only one group the actual pill and give the other group something they think is a pill but actually has no medical effect. We call this kind of a dummy medicine a placebo. Now if the pill has no effect and people are recovering on their own then both groups will recover. The same will happen if there's only some placebo effect. But if the pill is the reason for the recovery then only the medicine group will recover not the placebo group. This kind of a trial where we give the medicine to two groups and compare the efficacy of the medicine against a placebo is called a placebo controlled trial with the two groups being called the medicine group and the placebo group or the control group. We are controlling the factors that might influence our results and with that we've explained the third part of our complex name and already you can see we've taken care of nearly every factor other than the pill that might influence our results. There's one term left and one major factor bias. A bias is a preconceived notion about something and it leads you to perceive something that's happening in a certain way. For example, you may feel you're getting medicine and that might lead to you attributing your recovery to the medicine irrespective of whether you're in the medicine group or the placebo group. We want to know if this bias has any role in recovery. That's why we don't inform participants as to whether they're getting the medicine or the placebo. In other words, we blind them. Now by comparing both groups, we can tell how much of a role this bias played in the recovery. But this is only single blinding. What about double blinding? It's not just the participants who may be biased. The medical officers who had administer the pill and examine the patients also could be biased. For example, if they knew which was the medicine group, maybe they might be very thorough in their examination of that group, asking detailed questions, using instruments to measure temperature, BP, pulse rate, etc. But for the placebo group, they might just ask basic questions like has the fever gone down and may not do a detailed analysis because they are biased in favor of the medicine and this might actually influence results. So what do we do? We blind them too. Now they also do know which group is the medicine group and which the placebo group. This kind of a trial we call a double blind and with that we cover the last term in our name. If you had a pandemic in your hands and you had a medicine that passed this kind of testing then you can be very sure that that medicine is going to be very effective. Because at every step of the way, we stop to think, hey, what could be the reasons the medicine may not be effective, but still we're seeing recovery. And we eliminate those reasons one by one. In fact, this method thoroughly tries to prove that a medicine might not work. And if the results are still in favor of the medicine, that's when we say, hey, you know what? This actually works. This kind of testing is not just a good test for your fever pill, but every conceivable medicine or substance on the planet can be tested this way. Every pill, drug or vaccine that comes from modern medicine has to be tested this way before it's approved for sale in the market. If this doesn't happen, then we don't know if the medicine actually does what it claims to do. The amount of effort that the designers of this kind of testing must have gone to just to come up with all this is just insane. I can only imagine. The other advantage of this kind of testing is that safety of a drug automatically gets tested. In the process of testing, you give the pill to so many participants. Any adverse event that might happen because of the pill 
would be documented by now. I hope I've explained the importance of doing this kind of testing on any medicine that gets approved for sale. RCT is the gold standard for testing the efficacy of anything that can be called medicine. Not only that, but this kind of testing is important from a safety standpoint. And now you can probably see where the problem might be with alternative medicine. On the 9th of November 2014, the Indian government under Prime Minister Modi converted a small body called the ISMNH, the Indian Systems of Medicine and Homeopathy, into its own ministry called Ayush, which stands for Ayurveda, Yoga and Naturopathy, Unani, Siddha and Homeopathy. If you're wondering how naturopathy got in there when it's not even part of the acronym, I'm wondering the same thing. Basically, these are all systems that don't come under scientific medicine. In other words, Ayush is India's ministry for alternative medicine. Now all of these, let's remove yoga because it isn't really a system of medicine and it probably deserves its own video. These were all developed in a pre-scientific era back when we had theories like the five elements or the Panchabuddhas which supposedly everything was made up of. And Ayurveda, Siddha and Yunani believed that these five elements combined to form the humors that the human body was made of. Ayurveda, for example, calls these humors the three doshas, vata, pitta and kapha. Not only do these five elements or humors or doshas have no evidence for them, but today we know exactly what the human body is made up of. And it has nothing to do with these five elements. In other words, the theory that forms the basis of these systems of medicine is completely disproven. But do they update themselves based on these new learnings and understandings? No. Now, most of these are points I've spoken about in previous videos. So the ones among you who have watched them might feel like I'm being repetitive. But I feel like this video will go out to a lot more people and I have to make sure I cover every point thoroughly. Most of my criticisms in this video will be against Ayurveda because Ayush is basically 70 to 80% Ayurveda and it is the system that's generally recognized as the Indian system of medicine. But most of the criticisms I direct at Ayurveda can be said of these other systems as well. Now we discussed that the theories that all these forms of alternative medicine are based on are extremely flawed. But then why do they survive? One reason is because the patient's recovery may be due to multiple other factors and need not be due to the medicine. But the people who use the alternative medicine may attribute the recovery entirely to the medicine. I've explained all this in detail in the previous section for anyone who might have skipped all that and jumped straight here. The other reason is Ayush. The way it promotes alternative medicine, you'd think it was a lobbying firm. Remember that extremely flawed study citing which Patanjali released their Ayurveda remedy for COVID called Coronel? Guess who was with them every step of the way? The Ayush ministry. From the banners to the release press conference. Remember the promotional statement they'd made regarding how it was homeopathy and Ayurveda that cured Prince Charles of COVID-19? Against which Prince Charles's office had to come out and call bullshit. Or how about it promoting the idea of immune boosting during the pandemic when the whole thing is just a scam? One of Ayush's aims is to promote the systems of medicine that come under it. But since when did misinformation become synonymous with promotion? Obviously, this is not all they do. They do a lot more, but these are some clear red flags that I see. I recently happened to go to Nimans Mangalore, a national center for neurology and mental health run by the government. One of the most reputed institutes of neurology that I know of. That's when I found out that they have an Ayush department. When a patient finishes their consultation here, after their regular neurology consultation, they are asked to go to an Ayurveda specialist. These kinds of Ayurveda departments are there in all reputed government medical institutions now. So why are they there? Do they do any consultation or prescriptions themselves? Not really, they just there at the end of all consultations just to give lifestyle advice. I'm not sure how helpful this is or if it's any help at all, 
or if there's any evidence showing benefit from this kind of consultation. I mean, people go to regular doctors without any of this in private hospitals and they're fine. You know what this looks like to me? An effort to legitimize Ayush medicines in the eyes of patients who might not know any better. I couldn't help but feel that this is like a dilution of modern medical care. I mean, if the alternative medicines under Ayush are genuinely beneficial, wouldn't those results be apparent when we do research on them? The answer is a resounding yes. Take aspirin. It comes from the bark of a willow tree. The only reason we have this medicine today is because we studied and researched the herbal remedy, isolated the exact compound that's behind the beneficial effects and processed it to get aspirin. Take artemisinin. It's an extract from a traditional Chinese medicine herb that's used to treat malaria. The researcher whose scientific research led to its discovery to UU won the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 2015. So what exactly is modern medicine? It's a repository of drugs and procedures that have a desired effect on the body. Something that has been established through proper research like what I've described earlier in this video. The drug may originally come from traditional medicine or a herb or an animal or a bacteria or a fungus. It doesn't really matter. So yes, I definitely see potential in Ayurveda. Even though its theory is flawed, it's been a around for more than 2000 years. This is enough time to accumulate a vast repository of herbs for various conditions. Herbs that might have active components that can be isolated and extracted through research. That's the key. Research. Positive effects, if there are any, have to be established through research. People all over the world are suffering from debilitating diseases, some of which are incurable. So shouldn't they have access to an effective treatment no matter where it's from? Why classify medicine on the basis of its origin like as Ayurveda or homeopathy? We should classify medicine on the basis of its effectiveness on whether it works or not, even if it comes from alternative medicine. And by the way, you know what they call alternative medicine that works? Medicine. What's more, this same testing and research can lead to better safety. So is this kind of research being done by Ayush? If you go look at the Ayush Ministries portal on the CCRS web portal, you can actually see a lot of these studies have been registered there. But none of them are actually published. And even if they are published, they are going to get published in some dubious lower level third rate journal like Journal of Integrative Medicine or Journal of uh, Yogic Knowledge or something like that or the Tree of Knowledge and all that. And uh, recently they, uh, they they even published a paper in the Journal of Magical Thinking. There is a journal like that. And the publisher is, I mean that publisher's name is also like that. That was actually reported by newspapers also. So that is the stuff that they do. I mean, you take money and you do some vague work and you publish in some dubious journal and make it a news item. The newspaper will lap it up, all the social media, uh, uh, online media, everybody will lap it up and people think something great has happened. Absolutely nothing has happened. I mean, there is not a single drug. So there are some, um, yeah, I think this is very important because you mentioned that has something been done. So there are some proprietary drugs that has been designed by Ayush Ministry along with CCRS uh, with the help of uh, other institutions, right? So they have these drugs for diabetes like BGR-64 and you know, stuff like that. Uh, but if you actually look at that, uh, na there, are, there is no validated or replicated proper peer-reviewed published data on these drugs. They have been directly marketed as something that the Ayush Ministry or the CCRS has identified as being uh, something of value for the people. And a lot of people, and I think uh, the Hindu has written about how dubious those studies were and how, how much of a fraudulent product uh, this particular drug was. Uh, so you have a lot of drugs like that, um, where there is no actual research done, but it is marketed on the basis of uh, fake claims that research has been done. Are they doing some research which might have some positive outcome in the future? I'm yet to see a proper research uh, that has... Uh, I mean, a good quality research with good methodology yet to come out from the stables of Ayush. Um, I'm, I'm sure they're doing a lot of research because a lot of money is being used or a lot of funds have been given to Ayush uh, to carry out research. 
and uh, the website talks about a lot of research that is ongoing some of which are uh, completed also but i don't see any of them being published in any reputed journals or uh, any of those with a proper methodology or a sound, uh, 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 solid uh, quality kind of trial because if that uh, had happened i would we would definitely know about it so what we get instead are small pilot trials or some basic science trials some computational studies um some observational uh, studies from uh, not not only the public uh, ayurveda institutes but from private ayurveda companies uh, but this does not translate uh, to anything clinically so i have not yet seen a good uh, publication or a research uh, you know study that has been fully funded by the ministry and that has come out from the stables of ayush at this point i should address something this video seems awfully one sided doesn't it i'm sure my haters would have noticed it i'm sure i'll get a comment like oh why didn't you include an interview with an ayurveda practitioner and here's my answer you think an ayurveda practitioner would want to give me that interview and have their name attached to it after they know what the topic of this video is they risk having their license revoked by an art with a body that doesn't like what i say you're welcome to prove me wrong though if you're an art with a practitioner and you're watching this and you'd like to have a discussion with me publicly feel free i'll even tell you what you can do to convince me i'm wrong just show me evidence and not some way conclusion from a random paper but a proper well designed study with a peer reviewed conclusion and to anyone who's asking me was my journalistic integrity why am i not showing both sides of the argument this is like asking a journalist showing the shape of the earth is round and asking them why they're not showing what flat earth is say because the truth doesn't lie in the middle it clearly lies to one side it's not your job to show what these guys are saying and what these guys are saying it's your job to put the truth out there and back up your arguments with evidence for why it's the truth Okay so we've established that Ayush drugs are both ineffective and unsafe if that were the case then why are they available in the market at all because these are these are not marketed as medicines these are marketed as health supplements or nutritional supplements they don't they don't enter the domain of medicine right they are not drugs for somebody to have some somebody to call something a drug it should be an isolated compound which has specific effects mm. at the cellular molecular cellular tissue organ level in the body and you should know how that drug gets metabolized how it gets out of the body mm. at what dose it is effective at mm. what dose it is unsafe dietary supplements and nutritional supplements or food supplements do not require the rigor that we need for drugs in clinical trials so they escape mm. it they just need um, a certificate of good manufacturing practices uh, from the alternative medicine authorities or industrial authorities whoever that is and they can directly market it they may be legally recognized as supplements but people treat them as medicines they're going to take these medicines when they're ill because they think it will help them because that's what they've been told they need to be legally protected i decided to look at what sort of regulations exist for these medicines on the ayush website it talks about a law the drugs and cosmetics act 1940 and the rules 1945 which provide the rules and guidelines for standards and quality of all to medicines for this section i decided to take the opinion of someone who is an expert in these laws advocate akash satyanandan deals with these laws and discuss the same with me when we say about the requirements let's say for an ayurvedic medicine if it is described mm -hmm. in textbook the ingredients the indication and all those details would be as per what is required in uh, what is already written down in the textbook and there is no safety study that is required because because it has passed the test of time it is assumed that these are safe if you know see the legal regulation yourself this is the drugs and cosmetics rules 1945 and you can see it here ayurveda siddha yunani drugs safety study not required proof of effectiveness not required if it's a proprietary drug like patanjali's coronal safety study not required proof of effectiveness just a pilot study is enough and remember that horrible coronal study was 
a pilot study. A pilot study is basically a small scale study just to see if there is any warrant for a bigger large scale study. And by the way, I'll leave that link to Drugs and Cosmetics Rules 1945 below you can go check it out yourself i'm just reading this and i'm literally shocked what responsible laws regarding medicines would say something like this so uh when i visited abby in his lab uh, and mm -hmm. he showed me reports of what he analyzed in these uh in these medicines and what he found um he there were a lot of uh things like steroids and modern uh -huh. medicine drugs for certain conditions that were found in the alternative medicine formulations. Uh -huh. Like Ayurveda formulations had steroids in them. So those are clearly adulterants. So this seems like it should be legal. What does the law actually say about adulterants in these formulations? If they are complying to the good manufacturing practices as they are required by law, uh, these kind of adulterants wouldn't be there. But what I understand from you is that these adulterants were not by accident, but may more with a purpose. Mm. And mm. that is something that uh, can't be stopped by law unless the, the law enforcement agencies also step up and stop this practice. Yeah, that's also something I want to ask you. Uh, like, is the enforcement regarding this law what what is the enforcement like is it rigid is it actually happening or not happening it is unfortunately not happening or if we, if it is all it is happening it is not happening to the extent that is desirable if they don't care about safety testing then who even cares about adulterants nobody is going to check for them it's truly laughable how much regard for safety these legislations have. If Ayush were a company, their motto should be promoting alternative medicines at any cost. Sometimes the cost is public health. What can we do? We've seen how damaging Ayush has been to the country, but is the situation similar anywhere else? Alternative medicine is not just a problem isolated to India, it's a problem the world over. But what's it like? Does it have government support anywhere else like it does in India? Are there government bodies like Ayush that act like a lobbying firm? Alternative medicine is global. So every country has its own, uh, you know, its own specialized alternative medicine. In Japan, they have something known as Kampo medicine, that is uh, K-A-M-P-O, that is their uh, traditional medicine. China has TCM, traditional Chinese medicine. Even if you go to Europe and US, they have their own, uh, I mean, in South America and all, they have their own kind of traditional practices. Those are traditional healers. But I think India is the only country where this is being taught as a profession over five years, giving a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and sometimes you can even go for a PhD in Ayurveda. That's right, there are bachelor's and master's courses in all these medicines. In fact, the entrance exam need through which students take up both these types of courses is a single entrance exam. The top ranking students of this exam get a seat in a prestigious modern medical institution like the AIIMS and get to do their MBBS, while the bottom ranking students have two choices ahead of them. Either repeat a year of learning and preparing for the entrance exam and take it again and hopefully get a a seat in an MBBS course or go for one of these alternative medicine courses like the BAMS or the BHMS. A lot of students just opt for the latter because they don't want to be stagnant in life. They want to get ahead and in their eyes, alternative medicine is not really a bad option. They've probably seen Ayurveda and homeopathy doctors all their lives and now there's this convent body promoting it. So it's clearly not a bad career option, at least in India. They'll end up choosing an alternative medicine course, BAMS or whatever, uh, not knowing the pseudoscientific nature of these medicines. I want to get a perspective of how alternative medicine is handled in the UK. I got a chance to sit down with Dr. Rohan Francis, who is a cardiologist in the UK and also runs a popular medical YouTube channel called Medlife Crisis, which I'll link below. He's also been pretty vocal against alternative medicine on his channel. Here's what he had to say. Well, I don't think the UK deals with alternative medicine particularly well. I don't think it's any worse than comparable countries. And maybe there are some things that we do a little bit better. 
I think there are lots of countries that do do things worse. I think India is far less well regulated in terms of um, uh, unproven medical therapies. I think the US is far worse. But the UK has at least one thing going for it, which is that we've got a, a nationalized health system, the NHS. So it is really a single system that looks after the whole country. And the advantage to that is it's centrally controlled. So this is taxpayer money. So there's a lot of scrutiny on what can and can't be provided. And until a few years ago, you know, within my uh, time practicing as a doctor, um, things like acupuncture and homeopathy were quite widely available on the NHS. And there was a lot of um, criticism from practice from doctors saying, look, you can't be spending taxpayer money on things that don't have good evidence. And they were withdrawn. And a lot of countries take a lead from the NHS. And this is a, a, a body called NICE, the National Institute of Healthcare Excellence. Uh, it's an it's um, uh, acronym. Um, but it, what it does is, is it sets guidelines. And a lot of other countries base their practice on these guidelines. So that, I think, is, is a positive. But the big problem with every country in terms of regulating alternative medicine, the UK has the same, is that the NHS can regulate doctors who have a license or nurses, but people who just set themselves up as a medical healer or therapist or, you know, even there are some terms which are not medically protected. So online, you'll um, see people calling themselves, say, a dermatologist, which is not actually a legally protected term. We've seen people like chiropractors start calling themselves doctor in recent years. Um, and these things have just gradually crept in to erode the public understanding of, of, you know, who are you actually seeing? What are their qualifications? And if you're not a member of a professional body, like the uh, General Medical Council that oversees doctors, then you know, who are you actually answerable to? So there's no group that is is going to be regulating these people who are outside of professional standards, um, except the government. And, and, you know, frankly, the government doesn't do a very good job um, uh, looking after these things. After talking to Dr. Rohan, I realized how similar yet so different things are in the UK and in India. We may not have socialized healthcare, but it's still the citizens money, the taxpayers money that's being used to fund a body that's making an existing problem worse. The Ayush ministry's budget this year 2023 stands at 3,647 crore rupees and it's constantly been increasing every year and most of that money is being used to conduct research that has no proper clinical outcome. You could ask yourself why is no genuine research being done? I mean, it's no secret how RCTs are conducted. If a mere YouTuber like me could learn about it and put it in a video, I'm sure the research departments at Ayush would be able to conduct genuine research with RCTs and show the results. Why haven't they done so yet? I think it's because the results will be negative and Ayush doesn't want that. Badly designed research with positive results can at least be shown on the Ayush portal. Negative results can't. If they keep doing the former, then they keep getting money from the government at no cost, right? Wrong. They're doing this at the cost of public health. Their clear negligence on safety has a cost. Outside India also, Ayurveda doesn't have a great reputation. The US FDA for example warned people against the use of Ayurveda for the presence of toxic metals in it like lead, mercury, arsenic etc. If you're familiar with the verses of classical Ayurveda then you'll know that these verses describe lead, mercury etc. toxic metals as ingredients. This wasn't an accident that these toxic components were found in these medicines, the primitive science of Ayurveda considers lead, mercury, etc. as genuine ingredients. Now, I'm saying all this and I'm sure this video would have gotten a ton of hate comments by now. There is a section of people whose livelihoods directly depend upon alternative medicine, like its practitioners. They're not gonna like this video. There are people who think I'm attacking their religion with this video. I don't give a rat's ass about them. It's the former group that I care about and we need to talk about them.
put yourself in the shoes of an alternative medicine practitioner and think about why you went into that career. You'll probably point to all the Ayurveda and homeopathy practitioners you've seen as a kid, how the government did many things to portray it as a good career option like forming a ministry around it or merging all the medical entrance exams for both alternative medicine and regular medicine into one, the same one that you wrote that led you to the career that you're in now. Can you be blamed for the career you're in today? And now here's this guy on YouTube painting all alternative medicine in a bad light. That's your profession. Of course, you're going to have an angry reaction. What about all the careers being affected? What about all the families that depend on the money they earn from this? profession. To all such people, I want to say the purpose of medicine is not to give someone a profession. The purpose of medicine is to treat the sick. I'm not making this video with the intent to attack someone's profession. As a science communicator, it's my job to help people differentiate between what's scientific and what's not, especially if it concerns public health. But at the same time, people whose profession is altered to medicine, they can't be doctors but they still need a profession to that they can earn money from. I had a chat with Dr. Abby about this. Like someone who's just finished a bachelor's degree in alternative medicine, who's just learning about how pseudo-scientific it is and doesn't want to practice it, what career options does he or she have? I have had a lot of uh, such young graduates messaging me on Twitter and uh, on my email. They want to know what can they do next to improve their chances at a profession or a career. So initially, a lot of these courses were completely shunned away from uh, other courses that they could branch out into. For example, if I do my MBBS, uh, I can, if I want to go into hospital administration, I can do an MHA, Master's in Hospital Administration. Or if I wanted to do a, a public health course, I, I can do a Master's in Public Health MPH or I can even do a diploma or a fellowship. That, that option is open for me because I've done my MBBS. But if I've done my BAMS or BHMS, earlier on, these options were not uh, available because that's not the real medical uh, degree that you're holding. But now a lot of institutes, including government institutes, have opened up the option of uh, BAMS or BHMS graduates to opt for other branches to, you know, to take complete U-turns. So somebody who has done a, a BHMS can go do a master's in public health and then start doing work in public health. And that has nothing to do with the stuff that they have learned. So the public health has its own uh, set of principles and protocols and practice which are modern medicine based and they can directly go into that. I know a lot of BMS uh, graduates who have uh, initially, they used to do this, something known as medical transcription and went, in, went on to medical, being medical transcriptionist. Uh, some of them do um, uh, master's degree in, like, like I said, public health or nutrition or something like that. And they can just branch out. So there are a lot of options there. I mean, going back and, and doing another bachelor's degree is not that, uh, I mean, not that feasible for everyone. Uh, but then there are uh, BHMS and BMS uh, graduates who have actually gone back and done MBBS and then gone and taken the right path. But that is expensive. You have to again spend a lot of time studying and uh, I mean again studying the degree for the degree also. So that's not feasible for everyone. Nutrition, public health, hospital administration, medical transcription, paraclinical and paramedical options, physiotherapy, pharmacology and research. These are some of the fields that an alternative medicine graduate can go into. The choice will be up to them. Will they decide to side with public health or look their patient in the eye and give them potentially harmful substances in the name of medicine? or? at the very least, give them false hope. During my interview with Dr. Appy, something he said stood out to me. So at that point, even I was unaware that herbal medicines can cause so much of liver injury. I was, I did not know. And like every doctor, and even most doctors now, 
uh at that time i was also at the opinion that you know herbal medicines are fine as they're safe they don't do anything this has been true with nearly every doctor i've come across they treat alternative medicine as something ineffective but harmless they might even advise their patients to take alternative medicines if their condition is benign their thinking is usually along the lines of hey if there's some benefit that the patient might get from taking these alternative medicines like from the placebo effect then let them i think doctors need to learn about alternative medicine in their syllabus in medical school i think their curriculum must include alternative medicines how they work their safety their effectiveness this is the only way to keep them better informed why because avoidable public health burdens like untested drugs and supplements in the market that cause liver damage is something they themselves are gonna eventually have to deal with it's better they know about this than be forced to learn about it when a patient with complaining of such issues turns up at their door if they're informed they can keep their patients better informed as well Let me ask you something. Why should medicine even be scientific? Assuming alternative medicine is somehow made harmless, ineffective but harmless. What's wrong with it just existing there alongside regular medicine? I mean, science won't accept it, sure, but so what? Is there any problem because of it? In 2003, Steve Jobs got diagnosed with a rare kind of tumor in his pancreas. Instead of immediately opting for surgery to remove it, he chose to treat it using alternative medicines. When he saw that wasn't working, he finally opted for surgery in 2004. But it was too late. He had cancer and it had begun to spread. He had to take chemotherapy and radiation treatments which kept him alive for a few more years. but he eventually died this is one thing alternative medicine can do it can cause a delay in patients getting the right kind of treatment just because an option of alternative treatment exists and is available to people they might wrongly choose it the other thing is that since modern medicine is subjected to large scale rcts before any drug is marketed we know exactly what's the rate of effectiveness that a drug has for a particular condition that reliability is completely missing in the case of alternative medicines it's like taking a shot in the dark and hoping to hit the mark There's one more reason. Let's assume your child has some serious medical condition and you're desperately looking for a treatment. Someone comes along and he says he knows exactly what your child has and he has the treatment to cure it. In your desperation, you believe him because you're not looking for any science or logic. You just want your child to get better. There are many fraudsters who look for desperate people just so they can scam them. Because when you're desperate, you don't think logically, you think emotionally and that's like the perfect time to take advantage of someone. And this can only happen when there are no laws in place, keeping a check on what kind of medicines get approved onto the market. And this kind of a market where there are no laws in place for protecting people, that's the perfect playground for these fraudsters so in summary why do we need medicine to be scientific one to prevent delay in the right kind of treatment two to make medicine reliable and three to prevent fraud now i'm not trying to avoid talking about the flaws of modern medicine there are several like the unavailability to some sections of society the expensive medicines corrupt doctors etc but i'm going to talk about all that in another video right now i'm going to shed a light on what kind of medicines and what kind of regulations for these medicines are there in the market I shouldn't even have to make this video and you shouldn't have to watch this to understand how RCTs are done and medicines are tested. Your country's government should do that for you. What do we pay them taxes for? It's the government's job to sort out fact from misinformation and set regulations accordingly to enforce safety laws and maybe even educate the public. It's not the people's job to learn all this. And when public money comes in instead of putting thousands of crores in alternative medicine maybe use some of that money to subsidize existing modern medical care train more actual medical doctors 
build modern healthcare in rural areas educate the public on how traditional medicine can be flawed and most importantly again subsidize also separate entrance exams there should be two separate exams for students who want to go into regular medicine and into something alternative a student shouldn't have to choose a career in alternative medicine just because of one bad exam result and if the laws around safety and regulation in medicines aren't being enforced or followed properly at least make it legally mandatory for manufacturers to put warning labels saying that this supplement has been known to cause liver damage in some people and if the government doesn't follow through on this maybe they shouldn't be in power good thing we're a democracy or are we i've worked really hard on this video it took longer than i expected to finally release it and so financially also this video is a big investment for me unfortunately these kinds of videos are not what brands want to sponsor i'm literally criticizing the government of india in this video no brand would want to be associated with such a video i don't know if this video is going to get demonetized or shadow banned or even taken down but it's a risk i'm willing to take because i think this is content that people need and you guys really like it so it's your support that keeps me going if you'd like to support me you can find the links below patreon buy me coffee upi youtube memberships thanks button website and merch many options at your disposal that full podcast with dr abby is coming out soon so stay tuned my gratitude goes out to dr abby philips dr rohan francis and advocate akash satyanandan for helping me make this video i want to ask you what do you think of a video like this uh, an intense deep dive should i do more of them less of them Let me know if you like this video. Check out this one where I analyzed an actual study for its design. I'll see you in the next one. Till then, remember, science is dope.